introduce yourselves. Um, and, and off we go. Um, ready to go live? Yeah. Order, order. Uh, welcome to this session of the Justice Committee. Uh, the first part of our session uh, is uh, looking at the Post Office Horizon Systems Offences Bill, which is currently before Parliament, in particular the implications that may have uh, for uh, the justice system and the operation uh, of the system. So grateful to our panel of experts who are witnesses to coming to join us. I'll come to you shortly. Uh, we have at the beginning of the, the meeting just to do with declarations of interest. Uh, I'm a non-practicing barrister, uh, former consultant to a law firm. Simpson. Uh, I'm a barrister with a current practicing certificate but not undertaking any direct court work. I'm a former Solicitor General, former Chair of CAFCAS, former Chair of the National Child Safeguarding Practice Review Panel. Uh, my brother is the Chair of the Prison Reform Trust and I'm currently uh, advising Ministers on family justice policy. Right. Joanna. Welcome, Joanna Cherry, who's guesting as the Chair of the Joint Committee on Human Rights. Joanna, Thank welcome. you very much, Chair. Non-practising member of the Faculty of Advocates. Uh, I'm a practising solicitor and partner in the firm solicitors. I'm yeah. a member of uh, CWU, the it's Union. Communication Workers Union. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Well, thank you very much for that. Um, can I just ask our panel uh, witnesses to introduce themselves? Shall we start remotely with Mr Rosenberg? I'm Joshua Rosenberg. I'm a legal commentator and journalist. Thank you very much. Dr Quirk. I'm Dr Hannah Quirk. I'm a reader in criminal law at King's College London and I'm editor of the Criminal Law Review. I'm Dr Robert Craig. I'm a lecturer in constitutional law at the University of Bristol. I'm James Chalmers. I'm Leeches Professor of Law at the University of Glasgow. Thank you very much and thanks for your, for your time. Can I just kick off? Uh, um, this is a rather unusual piece of legislation, to put it mildly, isn't it? Um, it, it purports to, to, to quash a raft of convictions. Uh, and I suppose there's a, we'll go into some of the detail of it in a moment, but I suppose it, it, it really ra raises the first thing uh, around um, whether or not it's actually going to achieve what it wants to do and, uh, and what the cost is. Because we've looked at the bill and uh, the aim is to quash the criminal convictions imposed by the courts, which are said to be unsafe because of the, the unreliability of the horizon system and the evidence that was generated uh, by it. Um, <clears throat> Do you think that the bill actually achieves that purpose uh, to start with? Um, it says that Clause 1 uh, says uh, that, uh, in effect, those convictions will be quashed on the date that the uh, uh, bill uh, has the royal assent. Have you, any of you ever come across such a procedure before? No, I think no, be no, no, I think there's a, you, we're all agreed this, this is wholly uh, 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 unusual. Um, is it justified? What, what are the risks of doing this? You're, you're shaking your head, Dr Quirk. Perhaps you tell us why. Thank you. I'm uneasy about this bill for, for, for a number of reasons, largely that Parliament and Ministers being involved directly in quashing convictions. I completely understand the sentiment behind the bill. It's been an appalling travesty of justice that the postmasters have suffered. But I think there are very significant concerns about Parliament getting involved in individual cases as it does. I think there's questions about what the status of these convictions. I think you may find people who've had their cases quashed by the Court of Appeal might wonder if there's a difference between their cases being their innocence um, and also those who've had pardons, um, however that uh, relates to it as well. Um, so I think the, the precedent it establishes is, is my biggest concern. Any, anyone else want to add to that point? I take the opposite view, I'm yeah, afraid. Tell, tell um, us why. I, I think it's um, not only necessary, not justified, but actually necessary. Mm. I think it's an excellent idea, and um, it, it has plenty. I think, well, to, take, to, to take Chitty's point of view, um, he says a pardon can be granted by Act of Parliament or by seal. So it's, it's, um, Chitty, 200 years ago, thinks it's perfectly constitutionally proper, and I would agree. Um, it's the idea of, the, the only, the only, just to, as an opening claim, the idea that you exclude some people who've applied to the Court of Appeal, to me, seems to undermine the entire purpose of the Act, um, which is to um, wipe away all of the convictions, I say wipe away as a colloquial phrase, um, from the, the entire period. And I think that's, an, that's exactly what should be done in this case, given the situation and given... And I think it's entirely consistent with what the Court of Appeal have said, which is that this is an affront to the conscience of the Court. What if appeal relied upon um, a, a test in effect where the horizon was essential to the prosecution case? This is going well beyond that, isn't it? What's the justification for that? Um, I think the, the fundamental justification is Blackstone's principle. 
which is it's better for 10 guilty people to go free than one innocent person be punished. Now, that's a cuddly principle. We all smile and, and think that's a nice idea. But when it, um, now we have an actual example where this systemic level principle is absolutely applicable, and it's not 10 to 1. It's the other way around. It's 1 to 10. So I think it's an open and shut case, really, in terms of... Um, in terms of I, think, I actually think we should lean in and say it's a good thing that some guilty people are going to get away with this because this is a systemic threat that the post office has posed. We've got people in Parliament now questioning the judges' role here. That needs to be squashed quickly because the judges have got enough to do without second-guessing what the prosecution are up to in their cases. So that's why I think that it's actually we should lean in. Yeah, I think we got the drift away. We got the drift. OK, what about yourself, Professor Shaw? I, I would also support the bill. I, I was somewhat surprised initially in reading it at the mechanism that convictions would be quashed immediately on, on royal assent, because one concern that does raise is that the public record is, by definition, no longer accurate. There's a group of yes. convictions recorded as such, but where the record cannot be relied upon. Now, that is remedied in part by the mechanism whereby the, the Secretary of State is to identify yes. convictions that, that should be removed from, from the records. But that exercise will, will not be comprehensive. It's, it's not the case that if a, a conviction is not identified as being quashed, it therefore stands. So it, it does create, I think, an unprecedented situation where the, there are convictions which are on the public record but which we are not to rely upon, but without a comprehensive mechanism for identifying which ones these are. Yeah. OK. And, and Professor Roosevelt? Mr. Osborne. Um, picking up Professor Chalmers' point, um, the, the point at which... Um, uh, this is uh, the point at which this comes into effect is, is, is the crucial point uh, because, as he says, it will be for the Secretary of State to send a message to the courts to say you must treat this conviction as an acquittal and uh, pass this on mm. to uh, the uh, criminal records people just as you would with anybody acquitted on appeal. Uh, and so uh, he's absolutely right. When the Act takes effect, the records will be inaccurate, and we won't know for a fact who this legislation applies to. But I think I agree with Robert Craig about the general point, um, which is that this is, as the government says, the least worst option. Uh, their concern for allowing this to go through the courts in the normal way is that uh, a number of people simply won't apply, uh, and if they do apply, these cases will take a long time, uh, whereas the government's position, as you know, is that this will clear everything up. The government intends this to become law by July, and when it becomes law, those people will be acquitted uh, by law, uh, and, of course, that includes people who've died in the meantime. Yeah, I, I, I understand that point. I mean, it had been suggested, and there's been some evidence uh, given to our committee uh, to suggest that the Court of Appeal could fast-track Mm. Uh, these cases, and that could be done much more quickly than uh, than usual. Um, you'll be a very experienced commentator in these in these matters, uh, uh, Joshua. Do, do you, is it realistic that could be done by July? Do you think? Um, the uh, Secretary of State, um, Alex Chalk, is sceptical. He thinks that uh, cases would be adjourned, and uh, uh, the courts would have to accept those adjournments. Uh, some would be done by July. It really depends on what approach the prosecutor takes. If the prosecutor, uh, generally speaking, the, the post office might be the Crown Prosecution Service. We haven't talked about the Department of Work and Pensions yet. If the prosecutor accepts that the conviction should be quashed, well, it will be quashed, and it can be done very quickly, and the courts are very proud of the fact that they have fast-track cases through in those circumstances. But what we're concerned about is the cases uh, where the uh, prosecutor does not accept that these people should be cleared, uh, there may not be very many of those, or, above all, the cases where people simply don't want anything more to do with the criminal justice system and are simply not prepared to allow their names to go forward uh, and appeal. Uh, there's also the advantage from uh, their point of view, which is that um, it won't be necessary for people to tell the world that they were convicted 15, 20 years ago and have now been cleared. Uh, their cases may have been forgotten about by everybody they knew then. Uh, they, this will all be private in the sense that they will have access to uh, criminal records. They will be able to show anybody who needs to know that they've been cleared. Uh, but the whole publicity surrounding them will not be uh, uh, brought up again by the fact that their case comes before the courts uh, and they will be named in court. Some people may want that, others may not. I don't know. I mean, as a journalist, you may have been able to, to look at this in more detail than uh, some of our academic um, uh, witnesses. 
Has anybody been able to quantify how many those people might be? I mean, you make a fair point. The Secretary of State has said there's a lot of people are not engaging. That will be right. Um, I'm not sure if anyone's been able to put a figure on what that is. It's about a I, I agree. Um, I, I it's think the only information we have is from the Criminal Cases Review Commission, uh, which has certainly been advertising because it certainly hasn't had as many people coming forward as were involved in the in the uh, Bates litigation. Dr. Ray, do you have any more on that? Um, just on the, the, the Horizon Compensation Advisory Board with Lord Arbuthnot yeah. and various yeah, and Chris, Chris Hodges and people. Um, have suggested that have, have have recently stated that the post office say that they are duty bound to oppose something like 330 of these right, appeals, okay. which means they still don't get it, and the reason is because they seem to think that they're private litigators, that they think they have to fight. They actually think they're going to be contempt of court if they don't fight. In other words, they're not thinking like public prosecutors. This is three months ago, so they still don't get it. That's another reason I think for for pursuing this approach. Dr. Um, one slight concern with almost forcing um, an acquittal on people, when we looked at other or well, previous uh, systemic miscarriages of justice, such as the West Midlands Serious Crime Squad, there were people who'd been wrongly convicted who did not want mm. to, yeah. to go back to that issue because they had, for example, a new partner who mm. they hadn't told. Mm. Um, so, so there may be, I appreciate the point about it's not made public, but there may be personal ramifications. Okay, I understand that. Yeah, Mr. Daly. Just one very quick question. I'm sorry, it's a very obvious question. Um, I think looking at the bill, the start date for convictions is the 23rd of September 1996. Mm. Could you just confirm why it's the 23rd of September? There was, not a, pilot program. There was a pilot programme that ran out, and, and the date, and so that could capture some people whose situation were before the, the main rollout. And, and just to, the, there are obviously lots of uh, post office prosecutions prior to that day, but the logic being that none of those involved the Horizons case. That's the idea. Thank you. Sorry, Chair, thank you. No, no, I mean, given that we are in a situation where Parliament, without a division, um, uh, passed the second reading of the bill, whatever we think about the principle of it, uh, it it's got this this far, um, uh, and we can debate the merits one way or the other. Is the bill we'd like to explore a bit going to actually do the job uh, adequately? So, for example, Clause 2 sets out five conditions that must be satisfied uh, before the um, conviction is quashed. Are those conditions sufficiently tailored, do you think, to meet uh, the, the justice uh, of uh, rectifying the wrong that, that everybody accepts has been done in this case. Are they adequate? You, you, you think they, they, they are, Dr Quirk? Or um, any, any bits where you think it could be improved, for example? I do. I wondered around Section 3 whether we needed to look at magistrates' courts cases. Okay. Um, and there's also a case that the Criminal Cases Review Commission has just referred. It wasn't sure if it was able to or not, where it was a magistrates' court plea where the uh, defendant has died and there isn't really a mechanism for referring those cases so I think they've referred it anyway as a punt but that might be worth something adding into the legislation so that they have that power then okay. in future we all cases. Know that there is a mechanism that where the Criminal Cases Review Commission can refer the convictions of people who are deceased. Only to the Court of Appeal. Only to the Court of Appeal but you can't do it in the magistrates. Yep. Yeah. Okay, so that might point. be worth that's a, a gap. statutory yeah. amendment. Okay. Yeah. That's, that's very helpful. Okay. And, any other observations on the conditions in Clause, clause two. Okay. Um, Joshua Rosenberg. Yes, Joshua. Thank you. I, I was just going to say they go much further uh, than the Hamilton case, don't they? Yes, they do. Um, yep. they're, they're much broader. Uh, and uh, you can see the government's intention. The government doesn't want any mm. officials in the uh, Department of Work and Pensions to have mm. to consider whether a specific case referred to it comes within what will then be the Act or not. And so it's tried to draft these very broadly. Uh, but of course, there is still the question about whether uh, prosecutions by the Department of Work and Pensions uh, should be brought into scope. Yeah, no, that, that, that's a fair one. As you say, uh, the, Hamil the test in Hamilton uh, was really whether or not the uh, horizon uh, data was essential to the prosecution, and this is, is more broadly, and Parliament is entitled, if it wishes to, to, to go more broadly than uh, the Court of Appeals ratio. Uh, Professor Charms. Perhaps just on that, you know, one difficulty which will arise in some cases is the sheer policy of information about whether horizon data was or, or was not essential. So one of the appeals in Ambrose, for, for example, yes was allowed solely on the basis that there was a line in an internal spreadsheet in the post office saying this was, was an audit case. Often with these cases, there, there simply are the records held anymore, they're certainly not comprehensive at this point, and therefore requiring a, a demonstration that the evidence was essential in, in the category will be problematic. Okay, and finally from me, but another colleague will come in, 
the explanatory notes around this section, so that you know, the criteria set out in the bill, um, are intended to be unambiguous. Um, is it unambiguous from your point of view? There are bound to be borderline cases, aren't yeah, there? Yeah. There, are bound, there are bound to be cases where officials are going to have to take a decision and, and yep. make a recommendation to the Secretary of State who has the power to um, <clears throat> give effect to what Parliament will have decided because if the Secretary of State uh, is not persuaded to inform the trial court, yep. uh, then the conviction won't be publicly yep. quashed. So the suggestion that this is intended to be done without anybody having to apply judgment can't really be right, can it? Somebody's going to have to apply some judgment somewhere. But the beauty of the time-based analysis yeah, is, is, is the beauty of the time yeah. limit is that it, it's 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 about as clear as you're going to get, which is a, which yeah. I think is a good thing. Okay. Any other thoughts around ambiguity, Dr. Quirk? I just wondered why there's a reference to the compensation scheme under the Criminal Justice Act of 1988 when these cases were all being dealt with under separate compensation. Under schemes. a separate provision, yeah. Okay. And that's not clear as far as we've seen so far. Okay. That's that that that's helpful. Dr. Mullen. Just furthering the discussion of the ambiguity element, and um, as you said, uh, if you make it essential, that's that, that's quite challenging. But in the other direction, given that someone will have to go through the cases just to check the bare bones of it, um, do you think it would be impossible to have, you know, somewhere that's between essential and um, actually no potentially no reference to horizon whatsoever in a conviction, where you could at least say it's mentioned? present part of the case in some manner at all, or, or you would agree with the government's position that even that would be too complicated to do and, and not, not feasible? I, th I think I would agree with the government's position there, and I'm not in a position to speak to the detail of this, but I would have thought most cases would involve some mention of Verizon in the sense this was the primary means for, for keeping records. Well, just, just uh, to give you an example in theory to help mm -hmm. the discussion, if, for example, you were seen taking money out of a till, I mean, Horizon might literally have no bearing on the case in any way, shape or form. It shouldn't be mentioned in any way, shape or form. That might be an example. It may be an example, but I, I would have thought in that sort of case, I may well be wrong, that there would be some mention in the papers that were available of the records on Horizon, because this mm -hmm. is the record-keeping system. So I, I can't uh, clearly identify any sort of test that would allow you to distinguish cases that you would quash from those that you wouldn't. OK. Anyone else feel differently? I don't feel differently. I just I, I think it's a bigger picture, which is even those ones need to be quashed because it's got to send a message to the post office and message to the future. And this, these, this, the actions of the post office for the last 20 years is going to be used as a case study across every Westminster system forever. That's the reputation that this generation have, have imposed on the post office. Dr. Quirk. I disagree, but I, I think it possibly wouldn't be an issue because they're not carrying out, if they're taking money out of the till, they're not doing so as part of their functions as a, a postmaster. So I, th I think you could exclude it that way. Okay. Okay. Raise an interesting thought. If, you, if, in, if you're behind the till, yes. in consequence of your uh, work as a postmaster, yes. aren't you then, and you then pocket it, aren't you then carrying that out in the course of your employment as a postmaster? I, I think the answer is yeah, yes to that, because yes, condition I, 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 C yeah, yeah, seems to me. is that. Condition D C is that at the time of the alleged offence, a person was carrying on post office business yes. yeah. or was working at a post office. So even if they were, you know, taking cash out of the till, they would still be doing that uh, as as a postmaster uh, rather than a walk-in thief. <clears throat> You're saying I'm that the moment that they steal it, they cease to be acting in the course of their employment, in effect. Or in the well, I think you could, there's a difference between taking money out of the till to give somebody their change and taking money out of the till to. You're not doing that as a postmaster. Yeah. Doesn't this discussion just illustrate that there is ambiguity? I mean, it's a bit of an old chestnut, isn't it? Whether if you do something criminal in the course of your employment, whether you're doing it in the course of your employment, or whether it's so extraordinary that it's removed from the course of your employment. That's a debate that's gone on in all sorts of spheres of law for quite a long time. And I I'm afraid I'm not quite sure what the outcome is on it, and, but... Um, I think that's but, but absolutely right, but I don't think that is the condition C test. I think no, the condition that's C right. test is simply where you're employed for working in a post office, not whether you're in the course of your employment. Exactly, yeah. yeah, that yeah but right. D, that's right. I'm thinking about D, where the alleged offence was committed in connection with running or working for the post office business. That's where right. the potential ambiguity is. Right. I think in connection is is rather different from course. I, I, I see the point, but I think it is rather broader than course of employment. It's clearly, it's clearly a broader phrase. In connection is broader or narrower than course of employment? 
See, I think it is a bit ambiguous. Yeah. It's a different circumstance. You'd be interested if it was tested in court, but I'm not sure if it... And a civil servant's going to have to actually... Yes, read, you know, the ...do something about <coughs> distinguishing them in some way. It's not a complete no. blanket. Okay. Um, yeah. Anything else? Um, I suppose the Lord Chancellor that one, one time talked in terms of a, an approach for some, it's all the, fr the fruit of the poison tree. Um, would it be simpler and easier perhaps to adopt in that approach? So that, you know, it, it's all tainted if it's come um, via the post office as prosecutor. Um, but that, can I just so develop that point? Because that, that's why I asked the question about the 23rd of September 1996. Mm -hmm. Because if it comes down to, forget me, forgive me, I'm going to, if it is a question of the reputation of the prosecutor, then every single prosecution that the, that, the Royal, that the post office has ever brought under any circumstances should be quashed on that logic. Yeah. I think the Horizon system is, because they look at the numbers jumping mm -hmm. um, at the time that Horizon yeah. was rolled out, there was a step change. So that's a really easy break point that you can go before that. We can't be sure, but we're going to let that go. But from the point that this system came in, the culture curdled and it became a different kind of beast that was going on, and that's the point at which you should but, move But forward. are you comfortable with, if you had the misfortune of being in court on the 17th of September 1996, having done exactly the same thing as somebody who was there on the 30th of September 1996, are you comfortable those two people should be treated differently? I think we have to draw a line somewhere, and I think the line is... Why is, it, why, why is And the line I would draw there is because that's when their culture changed. Internally, that's when, they're, when this curdling, the curdling, I call it, of the culture, whereby it became about... Um, so it was as if they were trying to, uh, uh, it was, it was malicious, malicious prosecutions and I think that's when it kind of started and I don't think we've got evidence that there was that culture before and that's sufficient for me to draw the line there. I, th I think this is one of the difficulties with the, the status of, for, for the postmasters as well because if we, I understand the sentiment of, of we just clear everything out mm. and say all these convictions were wrong and so be it if, if some guilty people mm -hmm get a bonus but then I think there's a danger that that then taints the acquittal of of all the postmasters who quite rightly say I was completely innocent of this so I, I think despite the good intentions of the act I think there is a danger of devaluing what's being done for individual postmasters here. Okay. Well, you might have just one, of, one of the things this committee deals with all the time all, you know, is things like IPP and things like this so we talk about retrospective legislation the danger always is that people are treated differently. And as far as I can see, the only explanation, which is not, I'm afraid to say Dr. Craig, not the most convincing explanation, is that as a result of a computer system being installed, that means that, that all these cases must be treated differently yeah. to all these cases before. I, I, I can't say, if you retrospective legislation on the basis of the logic that you put forward should apply to every single case the post office has ever put forward. Surely, yeah. it has to. Come to that, yeah, which is that yeah. um, there are two categories of abuse of process. Yeah. Category one is when there's a relationship horizontally between the prosecutor and the defendant that's an abuse and needs to be stayed. This has been found by Lord Justice Holdroyd in Hamilton to be a category two. That's an abuse to the conscience of the, of the court. And that becomes a systemic problem. And when it's a systemic problem, you need a systemic solution. And that's when principles like Blackstone's principle kick in. When you have to say, this is all wrong. This is, this, and they have to send a message that all of these prosecutions, because of this prosecutor, and that message needs to go forward in the future as well. So, so I think there's a systemic difference, and that systemic moment is when the prosecution stops being acting on the duty of the, for the uh, on, on, with their overriding duty to the court, and starts being about horizontal attacks on on, on people who are innocent. Do you want to follow up? I, I think there are dangers with that. As I said, when the Court of Appeal has looked previously at systemic wrongs such as the serious crime squad yes. cases, it hasn't just blanketly quashed everything. I think there are also, as you said, dangers with the, the retroactivity of it. You could quite easily see a scenario now where people who are convicted in Northern Ireland under emergency provisions legislation that have subsequently fallen foul now say, why shouldn't my convictions be looked at too? Or people who've received pardons, the Alan Turing legislation or the First World War cases, why are we being treated differently? This was a systemic abuse of our rights too. So I, I think there are dangers, despite the government having said this isn't intended to be establishing a precedent. I think it would be very difficult to argue against it. Any other observations on that point? I'll move to uh, Ms Hopkins. Thank you, Chair. Um, just going back to Clause 4, and we touched on it slightly, um, and Clause 4 of the Bill requires the Secretary of State to take all reasonable steps to identify uh, convictions quashed by Clause 1. 
and the Secretary of State must then notify the relevant court of these uh, convictions and most importantly must then notify the person or person's representatives uh, that the conviction has been quashed. Can you elaborate on any um, potential practical difficulties that you see with that approach um, for the Secretary of sta State in taking steps like these? I suppose that simply initially the, the state of the records that uh, are, are available for this. You know, obviously, this is not directly relevant here, but we, we know it in, in Scotland for states with a Lord Advocate. Essentially, all cases in, in this period are now past the period for, uh, for routine destruction of, of, of case files. Now, they have been able to get material in Scottish cases from the post office, and the post office does seem to have kept things longer. Whether it's kept them systemically would be, would be a different matter. So, it's simply identifying the cases that are concerned with what the facts of those cases were, insofar as the relevance to, to the various conditions, is going to be challenging. And, and I imagine that uh, tracing the individuals concerned in some cases will, will be very difficult as well. I, I'm sure that's right. Yes. If I, if I can come in there. Yeah. I, I, I'm sure that's right. I, I think this is the most difficult part of, of the bill. Uh, in deciding uh, which cases are covered. Now, in one sense, it may not matter too much because the government can say, well, uh, these people who are covered by this bill are cleared uh, whether they do anything about it or not. If they want to prove it, if they want to uh, get a, a, a disclosure and barring service, uh, a clear um, uh, a declaration, uh, then they go through the process of telling the Secretary of State and of course they can make representations uh, and uh, the, uh, uh, the government has to listen to any representations made on behalf of anybody, by anybody, uh, in, in reaching its decision and maybe it could even be challenged by judicial review if the Secretary of State uh, declines to uh, uh, sign, uh, to find that somebody comes within uh, the, the categories. Uh, but it is very tricky um, and uh, it's going to be imperfect and I don't think anybody's suggesting that all the cases which are covered by what will be the Act will actually uh, be referred to the various courts. Uh, it, it is quite messy, uh, but on the other hand, um, unless you actually are going to publish a list of everybody who's cleared uh, a statutory instrument, I thought that was one way the government uh, might go through it, uh, unless you're going to do it that way, you've got to have some way of establishing who actually comes within this legislation uh, given that nobody is actually going to be named in the Act or any secondary legislation. Can I come back to Dr Quirk? Thank you. Um, I wonder if a possible compromise might be, rather than the Secretary of State doing it, asking the Criminal Cases Review Commission to do it, as it would then slightly distance the, the referral mechanism from, from the executive. Um, can I just, uh, press ahead with a couple of those nuances that have been picked up already. Um, talking about who will be responsible for administering the scheme and your suggestion actually is the uh, CCR uh, to sort of take that step back. If there are disputes, and that's the point raised about um, whether a conviction has actually been crossed, how should the Secretary of State handle that? There was a suggestion there about JR, but I don't know if anyone's got any views about that sort of uh, dispute. I suppose it's, it's really... A... Yes, sorry. sorry. Okay, it's really a question of what guidance officials are given by the Secretary of State, isn't it? Uh, do they err on the side of including people, as, as Robert Craig argues, or do they try and save money, um, which what every department would normally want to do? Uh, so I think we can. Ex we can. Um, it's reasonable to expect the government to tell us what sort of guidance uh, will be applied uh, when officials are going through all these cases. Just a final point, sorry. We talked about um, whether people in practice, those who've been affected by the, the Horizon scandal, could they just consider their conviction to be quashed? They can't consider their conviction to be quashed until they receive that notification by the Secretary of State. That's not right. Uh, they can consider their conviction to be quashed as soon as the Act um, achieves royal assent. The problem is uh, proving it. Uh, and they can't prove it uh, without some notification from the Secretary of State. But yes, uh, they can say, uh, they can celebrate in, on this day in July that their conviction has been quashed uh, because they will know uh, 
uh, they will be confident that they come within the wording of what will then be the act. Um, but how you persuade others is, is the problem that we're talking about. So what we need is some, in fact, some, some, some process whereby someone can prove, let's say, to the visa department at the American uh, embassy, if you want you to go there, or a potential employer, I am one of the people whose conviction has been quashed by this. Mm. And have, we don't seem to have that mechanism spelt out at the moment, do we? Well, I think we have that mechanism in the, in the sense that once the Secretary of State has asked for the information to be deleted from the records, as, as it were, then any criminal record check is going to come up without that inf information. So, so that... I think is the mechanism, but people may, of course, only run up against the need to actually request it be invoked yeah. at the point when they're being denied a visa. I think it's maybe worth noting as well that there is some track experience in operating this sort of system in a slightly different way under the Protection of Freedoms Act, where requests can be made to have a conviction disregarded mm -hmm. for historic same-sex activity. So there is experience within the government in processing okay. applications. The difference there is there had to be applications. That was not automatic. Yeah, yeah I understand that. And if you wanted an example from the beginning of, 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 of an act of parliament doing something very similar to this, because it was treated as if it had been... You know, this, the, the, that, that exact act is a, is a good precedent. Okay. Can I just mention um, Clause 4, um, Subsection 4, yeah. where the Secretary of State identifies that a person's conviction has been quashed, yeah. the Secretary of State must take all reasonable steps to yeah. notify the person. So you would get a letter um, from the government so saying your conviction has been quashed. And you show that perhaps to the person. I presume yes. this, this only deals with people who haven't got in touch with the Secretary of State, so those who are involved in the process yeah. at the moment, they will have given their details mm. beforehand, so they'll be in a position to get letters quite that, quickly. That, that, there's probably means of being in with it. That, that's all. Dr. Mullen, thank you. Just to jump back slightly to clauses one and three, and about those that have, um, and as you might expect, those that probably felt strongly in, that they had a good case, gone to the Court of Appeal, and the way in which this Act excludes them. Um, I just wonder whether you think that's fair and justifiable? To begin with Dr. Quirk. If we're taking an expansive approach, then it's, it seems unfair to, to exclude them because the Court of Appeal may have been applying different criteria at that stage. Yes. The full extent of the scandal yes. hadn't come to light. So well, we it, talked earlier, that, you know, their test was that Horizon was essential and, that, and this test is just that you worked in a post office when Horizon was operating, a vastly different yeah. test. I don't know if anyone thinks it is reasonable, wants to add. No, I would also think it's unreasonable. The, the, I can certainly see the argument for cases from... I mean, Hamilton onwards, but if somebody had uh, appealed at the time when the problems with Horizon were, were not documented, it seems to me to be entirely unfair to exclude them from the Act on that basis. The CCRC um, has to assess whether to refer, and those people who didn't pass that threshold to be referred are going <coughs> to get a, a, a quashed conviction, and the people who did get referred are not, which seems to be uh, a bit unfair on the people who were close to the line and didn't get it, and the people who didn't make that below bar aren't going to get a quash, are going to get a quash. Does anyone want to play kind of devil's advocate for the government? What, you know, what do you think they're trying to achieve in, in doing this? The, the, they they're trying... Dr. Dr. Rosenberg. Uh, it, they're trying not to trespass on the territory of the courts. They're trying not to tread on the judge's toes any more than is necessary. Uh, and they've taken a policy decision that where a court has looked at a specific case and decided there was dishonesty, there is evidence of dishonesty apart from Horizon, we shouldn't interfere. But that's a policy decision, and that may be wrong uh, given the broad thrust of the legislation. And the reason it's wrong is because it's uh, a contested view of the separation of powers to think that it's a pure se separation of powers in this country, that we have institutional silos and there shouldn't be overlap. That's not our system. Our system is partial. It's all about checks and balances. This is a paradigm example of Parliament acting correctly under our system to step in and fix a mistake in the common law. And the fact that it, has to it, ha the fact that it should fix it in a generic and as broad a way as possible is because legislation is supposed to be that way. So that, to that extent, it's entirely reasonable. But, um, but the idea that this is a breach the separation of powers is not one that I, re I share. Thank you. Thank you very much. Ms Cherry and then Mr Steves. Thank you, Chair. Um, the bill only quashes convictions handed down in the courts of England and Wales. So if you are unfortunate enough to be convicted in Scotland or Northern Ireland, your conviction won't be quashed by this bill. My question there is, has the UK government taken the right approach by not extending this bill to Scotland and Northern Ireland? And I might start with Professor Chalmers, if I may. My, my view would be no, simply if, if, from a practical point, point of view, given that the Scottish Government has indicated it intends to mirror uh, the, this legislation, it's very difficult to see how the Scottish Government could make different policy choices um, to any significant extent 
from those set down in, in the bill. Given the imperative of quashing evictions as quickly as possible, which underpins this, requiring the Scottish Government to wait to see how this legislation passes through Parliament and how it is amended, to then try and, and mirror that late, later on seems to me to help no one, really. I, I can see the argument, which I think has been made in the Chamber, that the Scottish Parliament can, of course, pass legislation very quickly if it has to. But it would be better, I would have thought, to ensure that there was proper scrutiny of the, the mechanism within the Act for, for doing that if it wasn't being forced into making the policy decisions in, in a single day, which, of course, it can do if it has to. I mean, there's been, a, you'll be aware, there's been a lot of lively discussion in legal circles in Scotland about alternative ways of approaching this. Um, and I think it's fair to say when the Lord Advocate made her statement to the Scottish Parliament, she favoured uh, a more separation of powers approach than perhaps politicians have decided to go down. And I take on board everything Dr Craig says about that. Um, but what I'm interested in is another proposal that was put forward by somebody um, which you're probably aware of. There had been a letter to Scottish Legal News from a retired um, Sheriff, uh, Kevin Drummond, KC, who had said that he felt that this matter could be solved tomorrow, not just by the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service in Scotland, but also by the CPS in England, by each agency bringing to, the, to their respective criminal appeal court a list of convictions with case references and informing the court that investigations had revealed these convictions to be flawed and inviting the court to overturn these convictions. And he said such a step would have the additional advantage of, of um, re respecting the separation of powers. Now, I'm not an English lawyer, so I'm not sure how that would work with the CPS, but I wondered if he was talking about some uh, the Lord Advocate inviting the court of a, the um, High Court of Justiciary in Scotland to exercise its nobilia officium, its kind of its kind of equitable power to right wrongs. Do you think that's what he was getting at? And I just wondered what you thought of that proposal. I think what he was getting at, though I'm not entirely certain, was the the ability of the Crown to essentially indicate that it does not oppose an an <coughs> being granted. The limitation of, of that, I think, is that it has to operate in one or two ways. Either it happens after investigation, which is not going to be immediate. The Lord Advocate would require a considerable amount of time, I think, to make that judgment as to whether or not the convictions were ones that that could be sustained, or it happens on um, a basis which. Is, is not related to the individual cases. And Lord Advocate simply says, here are the cases uh, of conviction which resulted from reports from the post office. Please quash them all. I'm not sure the court would think it had the power to do that. And the problem beyond that, uh, which uh, goes back to a point Dr Quirk made earlier, is that it may undermine the, the quashing of, of convictions if it's believed that there actually has been no consideration of the merits and no criteria applied beyond it being a post office case. I think also you said there earlier that the Crown may not have actually have access to the relevant paperwork, and so they might not be able to identify the cases. Yes, the Lord Advocate has, has said that Crown Office has had to obtain information from the Post Office in order to establish what has happened in many cases. What I don't know is whether it is always possible to obtain that information or how comprehensive it is. I wonder what our other witnesses think about the decision uh, to restrict the Bill's application to England and Wales. I don't have much to add, except, and it's purely a, as a non-Scottish lawyer, uh, my understanding is the post office didn't bring the prosecutions right. in Scotland. That's, that's an interesting difference for me, speaking, uh, given what I've said tonight, today. I, I think there may be difficulties, um, partly sort of lo logical difficulties, um, like Northern Ireland comes under the remit of the Criminal Cases Review Commission, yeah. whereas there's an argument that Scotland is, is, is so separate it, it should be dealt with differently. Um, I think smaller jurisdictions probably are able to deal with the caseload more quickly. Um, in terms of getting the case back into the courts of appeal, um, it would more be a, a CCRC referral rather than the Crown Prosecution Service in England. I, I'm not sure of the, the Scottish distinctions. But again, I think particularly with Northern Ireland, there might be problems with bringing up these ideas around retroactive quashing of convictions, particularly following things like the, the Legacy Act, which has precluded so many other ways of dealing with um, conflict-related cases. It might be putting them in quite a difficult position. That's a very interesting point. Um, Joshua? Um, I don't want to stick up too much for the UK government, but, uh, but I would have thought it reasonable for the UK government to expect that the Scottish government would want to handle this itself in its own parliament. Uh, so it's slightly unusual 
uh, for Scotland to be saying to the UK government, well, will you legislate for us? But if that's what Scotland <coughs> wishes the UK government to do, you would have thought the UK government would be happy to amend the bill in that way. Can I just quickly go back to Professor Chalmers, if I may, Chair? Um, the point that was made there by Dr Craig, absolutely correct, of course, that in Scotland these were not private prosecutions. They were pursued by the Crown. Um, do you think that makes any difference to the legislative approach? Or should it, rather? I think it shouldn't, because I think what the Scottish experience shows is that the problem was not simply one of the, of the post office as prosecutor, but of the post office as investigator. Because the Crown Office, for, for some time, was relying on what it had been told at regard that the post office as one of the longest standing specialist reporting agencies. And I think there is a, a cautionary t the suggestion that has been made that actually what this shows is there's a problem with the the English system of private prosecution. There, there may or may not be such a problem, but requiring prosecutions to yeah, thanks, uh, Professor Chalmers. The um, actually the best um, uh, argument surely is the current criminal justice bill that's going through Parliament just now in which the Scottish Parliament has given legislative consent for the parts of the Criminal Justice Bill down here that apply to Scotland. And so would that not be a better way of addressing this issue for people in Scotland? Because the issue is, basically at the end, is to ensure that people are getting compensation at the same time and that people in Scotland and Northern Ireland don't have a delay in getting that compensation when people in other parts of the UK receive that compensation. I don't think, although I haven't seen recent figures, that legislative consent motions are, are that unusual. I wouldn't regard it as exceptional for the Scottish Government to consent in, in these circumstances. I think the, the rea practical reality is that I can't see that the Scottish Government has very much room for manoeuvre on the policy here, because it would be very odd, given the way this links into a UK compensation scheme and, and not a, a devolved scheme, if the Scottish Government were to say we, we want to do something different in, in terms of the, the scope of, of quashing of convictions. Now, of course, if it did, that would be a different matter, but in a circumstance where it's saying we want to mirror what is happening, but we therefore have to delay it, um, despite the imperative to try and get this done quickly, that seems to be, to be problematic. I would say, I mean, it's been suggested in the Chamber that one reason for um, asking the Scottish Government, the Scottish Parliament to do this is that there has to be a level of scrutiny of the, the law de advocate and the Scottish prosecution system. But at the same time, it was being suggested, well, the Scottish Parliament can legislate very quickly, and the three days was mentioned. Now, you, you can't have both. You either have the emergency legislation yes. or you have the detailed scrutiny. Yes. And either, either of those, I think, are valid arguments, but they don't work in conjunction. The scrutiny of the prosecution could happen after a bill was passed anyway. That that's a, a, another issue. The issue is is to quash convictions and to get compensation to people, isn't it? Absolutely. Um, <clears throat> you might be aware, Professor Chalmers, that the Scottish Criminal Cases Review Commission has been actively trying to contact people, and was actively trying to contact people to appeal, but hadn't heard from the majority, uh, although more than England. So does that raise a potential concern that the post office may not cooperate fully with the Crown Office and the Scottish Government, particularly given the reticence and the intransigence we've seen over the entirety of this situation? It may do. I think, I think it's fair to note that in the Court of Appeal judgments, there, there have been, unusually perhaps, quite complimentary words said about the Post Office and the Post Office's lawyers in terms of bringing forward relevant information, making concessions where, where appropriate. I'm aware that that's not an experience replicated across this whole sphere, but in terms of, of, of dealing with the criminal appeals, those more positive comments have been made. I suspect more generally there is just considerable difficulty in contacting people who may wish to have moved on long after the event, who, who may not readily be contactable. And there has been a policy decision taken with this legislation that actually there should be something done about the fact that people do not want to come forward and their conviction should be quashed whether they are asking for that to happen or not. Uh, does that also potentially impact on family members I'm thinking about people who, who are no longer alive? Absolutely, yes. OK, thank you. Thanks. Can I just come, come, uh, yeah, come yeah, back on that, Professor Chalmers? Just want, I just want to understand this properly because I think you've made a very important point there. I think what you're really saying is because this bill links into a UK-wide compensation scheme in relation to a UK-wide problem, which is this problem that arose of this malfeasance in the post office, then the Scottish Government is going to have to have 
almost identical legislation to fit into that. So it makes sense for there to be UK-wide legislation with a legislative consent motion, which, as you've said, is not something that's necessarily uh, unusual. Absolutely. I mean, is it fair to say, from time to time, people like myself get terribly excited about legislative consent because we think um, it, 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 where it's been withheld but it's been ignored, mm. but in actual fact, a huge amount of cooperative work goes on between the UK government and the Scottish government where le legislative consent motions are made and people like me don't get excited about it. <laughs> <laughs> so you're saying this is really just a very practical <clears throat> example of where this legislation is designed to right a UK-wide wrong and to feed into a UK-wide compensation scheme so it makes sense to have UK-wide legislation. Yes, I would agree with the point about this being a matter of, of, of normal cooperation. I, my recollection at, at the time of the Scotland Act was that the mechanism of legislative consent motions was, was seen as something that would be a bit exceptional. And, and actually, over time, it was seen that it was a practical solution to cooperating and ensuring smooth running of, of the process and not, in most cases, contentious. Thanks. Very clear. Thank you. Quite, Just very briefly, I wondered if one way around this might be uncoupling the compensation from... The question conviction. of the conviction. Yeah. If we're saying everybody who was convicted is eligible to, for compensation, that could surely go ahead, and then so by whatever mechanism. Before, yeah. you do the conviction as office. Okay. Understood. Okay. Thanks. Um, uh, thank you very much, Chair. Um, can we just go back to the ex exceptional nature that the uh, government bill is is proposing? Uh, and I was interested in particular, uh, Dr. Craig, uh, what you uh, quite, quite effusively said about uh, the, the approach that's been taken and have cited sort of in evidence of this approach that this isn't a, uh, a new departure for uh, Parliament uh, in overturning a judicial decision and I think cited the Burma oil case when mm. uh, there was compensation for the damage caused by British soldiers yeah. uh, on, on retreating that led to the War Damages Act of 1965 and mm. that was, was retrospective albeit it wasn't a criminal case mm. um, so, so bearing that in mind um, how, uh, how high a bar do we think uh, that needs to be reached to make this exceptional bearing in mind uh, there have already been 71 convictions quashed by the Court of Appeal and the fact that they, the Lady Chief Justice in the most recent case in Falcon uh, in February uh, said, quote, the court has been and remains committed to the efficient and swift dispatch of Horizon appeals. I mean, in terms of a precedent, um, Chitty says a pardon may be effectively granted, effectually granted either by Act of Parliament or under the Great Seal. So in terms of precedent, that's not even, that's not even a controversial position. But that's a pardon. No, I know, but the statutory pardons, if you, look, if you also look at uh, Chitty, are indistinguishable from, from Act, Act of Parliament in their effect. And, and I don't think we should get too hung up about whether or not a conviction is technically removed or not. I think that's a, that's a narrow distinction that doesn't, doesn't really help us. And uh, so Chitty says, um, generally speaking, it puts him in the same situation as which he stood before. Um, in so far it makes him a new man, so as to entitle him to bring an action against anyone who scandalises him in respect of the crime pardon. So I don't think we want to get too hung up on the dis narrow distinctions between whether it's a technical quashing or a pardon in this situation. But in any event, the king's right to pardon and remit the consequences of a violation of the law, says Chitty, is confined to cases in which the prosecution is carried on in his majesty's name. So you can't even pardon these because they're not brought by the king. So the only route open to these people is... Is that last point right? Uh, at that the is, end of the that day, is whether what it's Chitty a private says. prosecutor or not, uh, it appears on the indictment as the king against, or the queen against X, Y. The All prosecutions are brought in the name of the monarch, surely, regardless of whether it's the Crown Prosecution Service or a private prosecutor. Is yeah. that right? And what, uh, my understand, I, I'm not sure what the actual indictment said. I, that's a very good point, uh, Sir Bob. Um, but um, but Chitty is clear that if it's a private prosecution, it's not it's not open to be pardoned. Which means that before the the critical um, the, the CCRC was um, got the power to do this, your only remedy was to go to the court of appeal again, where the burden of proof is reversed. And if you haven't got evidence to undermine it because it's been destroyed, what, what the only remedy is an act of parliament. So I'm the not record. Sure that but you tell us who Chitty is. Oh, I beg your pardon. Chitty, Chitty is written Chitty. No. a treatise on prerogatives, 1820, so it's hot off the press. Um, uh, <laughs> Chitty on explain for the record why you rely on quoting that. Uh, because, because he's the leading uh, writer on prerogatives and he's got a section on pardons. I think Dr. Quirks wants to come in. Okay, I, I'm not sure that's completely right. There was the Michael Shields case, who was the Liverpool fan who was convicted yeah. in Bulgaria. Mm. Um, so that was a 
a foreign jurisdiction he was right. convicted. No. Stop with Bob Hall. Is it dealt with Bob Hall? May I check? Okay. Okay. I think it may be worth noting as well, just to answer the point you asked earlier, it was noted in the Hamilton appeal that the prosecutions were all brought in the name of the Crown, yeah. although they were private prosecutions. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. No, I think it's come to the point. Doctor, yeah. Joshua, do you want to come in? Sorry. Yes, can I pick up a couple of points um, uh, that were just asked? Um, I don't think we should be too hung up on the idea of this legislation being a precedent. Yes, in political terms, once this is through, as Dr Quirk says, others will say, me too, please. Uh, but uh, it's not a precedent in the legal sense. And the very fact that this legislation is before Parliament for the first time, uh, I think, shows us that you don't need a precedent to actually do something for the first time. And the fact that you've done it before doesn't mean you have to do it again. Um, and in terms of Parliament overturning decisions of the courts, um, we've got much more recent and current examples of that than yeah. Burma Oil. I'm not just thinking of the safety of Rwanda bill, which says the courts must conclusively treat Rwanda as a safe country, uh, which was not what the Supreme Court uh, found last November. I'm thinking more of the litigation funding agreements enforceability bill, which was given a second reading by the House of Lords yesterday. And as the minister said, it restores the law to the position it was before the Supreme Court decided the, the Packard case last July. Uh, and so uh, we do see examples currently of Parliament overturning decisions of the courts, and maybe this is just another one of them. Can, you put something on that? can, can, can I just, just yeah, come, come, to come back to, uh, to, to that question? Uh, and it's understanding the consequences of uh, the parliamentary intervention, if you like, in a judicial decision, uh, and whether by taking this route albeit in the exceptional circumstances that we all know about, uh, that uh, although it may not uh, have uh, sort of a legal precedent uh, that uh, is consequential on that decision, it may encourage others to use a parliamentary remedy rather than a judicial remedy in the future. Is that something that we should factor in and be concerned, potentially be concerned about? I think it's a good thing. It's a political constitution that we want to, re we want to reduce the people's desire to go rushing off to the court. Take your remedy to parliament. In the political constitution, this is, this is to be encouraged. So, we don't, we, so, the, so the idea that this is somehow a difficulty or a bad thing, that, that there's going to have more political discourse, more political applications to MPs to, to fix problems, good. Okay, uh, does, does <laughs> Joshua want to go, come back? I, I, his face suggests he wants to come back. <laughs> uh, I, 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 I don't really know what to think about that. I can, I can see the arguments on both sides. Uh, but I, I don't see why Parliament shouldn't be flexible. Um, and uh, just as the courts very often say this is not a matter for us, it's a matter for Parliament, uh, I do think to some extent, I agree with Robert Craig, uh, Parliament should be encouraged to deal with problems as they come along. And if Parliament thinks the courts have got it wrong, uh, Parliament should be there to put it right. Dr Quirk. Profoundly disagree. <laughs> um, if, if we look at the reasons for the separation of powers, you know, we, we should not have Parliament acting to, to convict individuals or to to direct they, they shouldn't be acquitted the rule of law needs to apply to everybody and if you have a situation whereby parliament can suddenly say oh but not to you and um, we're going to quash those convictions that that's fundamentally deeply dangerous in a, in a democracy and to to public confidence in the law we also don't want to have it reliant on public opinion because certain cases i think everybody has the utmost sympathy for the postmasters. What about school teachers or scoutmasters who've been wrongly convicted of, of historical sex abuse cases? That's a very difficult um, case to make publicly, and it would be more difficult for, for politicians to, to associate themselves with. The whole point of the law is it's not a popularity contest. The law applies to everybody and is applied by the courts in a, in a disinterested way. So I'm not saying that this should be done willy-nilly. I mean, yeah. when a qual qualified criteria might be that it's the greatest miscarriage of justice in the history of UK, then that might be a... a I'm just part. conscious that we have another panel to get on to before we finish this, so I want to make sure that we cover any remaining issues. Uh, uh, Mr Ali first, and I'll come back to other members before they get... Mr Ali. I, I think the uh, issue of precedence has been mentioned before, uh, but the explanatory notes to the bill state that the approach to quashing convictions in the bill does not set any constitutional precedents. 
precedence does a bill set and why might it be dangerous? I mean, we've, we may have rehearsed much of this, but any yes. things you want to add to... Well, this is when I was going to mention Burma Royal. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, but, okay. that, but, but, of course, the World, World War I soldiers, again, I take the point that there was a statutory pardon, but these are, these are examples, so I don't think it does set a precedent because the Parliament's been able to do this for about a 1,000 years. Okay. Yeah, observations? No. I think it sets precedent because it's happened, and I think Roy Jenkins gave a pardon to Timothy Evans right. after he'd been hanged and explicitly said... I cannot conceive of another situation. The facts are so unique. This will never happen again. And we've had multiple cases where we've had... Okay. okay. Yeah. Well, I just wonder whether... Um, I thought that... And I think it was Professor Jones that made the point that, this, that when we're talking about the reputation of... Uh, we come back to the start of this, the question of why the DWP cases were not included was considered. And therefore, if it is a... Should we say a reputational issue of the prosecutor then I can understand why that's the case. However, forgive me, it may have been Professor Chalmers. Professor Chalmers said, this may well not be the prosecutor, but the investigator that is the, the, the investigator of the facts that is the, uh, the crucial matter here. Well, I just wonder that if there is a police officer who is convicted of corruption, which relates completely to uh, the investigation of a number of cases, why on earth would this not set the precedent that every single case, every single one, potentially over a 25-year career, are not all tainted? And why are they? Why, why would you start a blanket um, precedent to mean that some people who potentially have committed some very systemic problem requiring a systemic solution, which is what an act of parliament is, and, and trying to, and, and to do, to, to, to deal with something which has um, undermined the very court system. That's the problem, because in terms of the rule of law, one of the other aspects of the rule of law is entitled to have a fair trial with all of the evidence in front of the jury and in front of the courts. And this has been prevented for decades. No, I understand that, by the but the point, in the, in the example that I gave, what you are saying is that the act of dishonesty may be in one case or two cases out of a, f I don't know, a thousand case career mm. is sufficient for 998 convictions to be quashed. I see what I mean. I'm, I'm not talking about individuals. There may be all the individuals. I'm talking about a culture mm. that has developed in that right. prosecution office. That, has the, that is the thing that needs to be but, but they, confronted. There are, there that's are new... exactly the same as the West Midlands Serious Crime School. Well, that's, sorry, that's the point I was going to make. That's exactly what uh, numerous examples we can show throughout. Mm -hmm. And there would be a lot of people, on the basis of this precedent, a lot of people who have committed the most serious, serious offences, who could have been convicted on the basis of good evidence, would just have their convictions just quashed. Mm -hmm. But that's why we have the CPS because that's the buffer between the investigator <coughs> and the court. No, but you've been making the argument that, that Parliament uh, should, if it feels appropriate, be able to... Yeah, and, 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 you know, obviously we, Parliament is, is sovereign and therefore can essentially do what he wants to do. But I don't think it's correct to say that this doesn't set any precedence. I, I think perhaps the best answer to that is that Parliament could, of course, draw a distinction uh, between different groups of cases and, and take into account the fact there might be people in the circumstances you've described, described who are, are very dangerous offenders, who are potentially still, still imprisoned, mm. and that, that therefore would make it inappropriate to deliberately take a, almost a rough and ready approach, which would involve consciously quashing convictions of people who might, who might be the innocent. Well, the, the, the other point I make is it, it gets down to investigation. What you appear to be saying, Dr Craig, is that the, the dishonesty as such is the fact that the computer system exists. You are, you are unable, and please, forgive me, I, I may well be wrong, and if there are cases in respect to this, there are cases whereby the investigative process could have been completely, honestly undertaken with good evidence uh, and, and all of that. And it seems to me a rather strange legal mm. scenario where um, honest investigation mm. following a proper conviction is tainted because mm. of a computer system that is, that is a, a sort of put into a, in, put into a, a, a post office which might have nothing to do with it. Absolutely, I mean, that's why Blackstone's principle is quite painful and ugly. And everyone thinks it's a nice idea, but when it actually comes to the rubber meeting the road, it leads to extremely difficult situations like this, which is why it's a systemic solution to a systemic problem. It's why it's incredibly rare. And it's rare because it's, 
even the post office in their latest submission to Sir Wynn Williams said, this is the greatest miscarriage of justice, in their own submissions, the greatest miscarriage of justice in the history of the UK. These are, I think, unique circumstances. That's why that, that this solution that is being proposed with an Act of Parliament is, in my view, the correct one. I think we can immediately make a bit of progress. Um, yeah, just come Dr. Quirk, then let's, let's move on very quickly to the remaining issues. Just, just very briefly, I think this, this case is exceptional in many ways, but the system is quite capable of dealing with it. We've got a Criminal Cases Review Commission, we've got a Court of Appeal that could process it. I'm not persuaded it needs exceptional measures to overturn these convictions. Okay, I understand. Somebody suggested you could triage, um, uh, for example, with, uh, rather like Section 31 <coughs> of the um, Criminal Appeal Act. Well, it was done with uh, the shaken okay. baby cases yeah. when, after there was concern about women had been wrongly convicted for, yeah. for killing their babies, I think it was the Solicitor General's office yeah. triaged all the cases, and then those that were found to be yeah. of concern were sent to the CCRC for further investigation. Okay. What among then, Mr Cherry, Mr. I, I do want to move on to a slightly different uh, area in terms of accountability for the uh, judiciary and, and the judicial system within this, this context. And, I know others, Dr. Craig, you did early on, have volunteered an absolutely robust defence that this has got nothing to do with uh, the judicial system. And, and I guess one of the, the arguments to that is, well, actually, ultimately, it was the Court of Appeal that, that picked that. So, therefore, there's nothing to see here. And I just wonder whether any of you might have a, a different view. I, I for example, um, looked at some of the previous Law Commission work around uh, expert evidence. And if I read from uh, one of their findings, it was that in the absence of a clear legal test to ensure the reliability of expert evidence, advocates do not always cross-examine experts effectively to reveal potential flaws in the experts' methodology, data and reasoning. And I, you know, I think if you could draw a direct parallel between that finding and, and potentially some of what's happened in these cases, and um, whilst the Court of Appeal finding it ultimately is great, you know, would it have been even better if the lower courts actually had managed to um, understand that? And, and it, does it show the necessary humility for the judicial system and however you might, you know, whether it's individuals or system as a whole, to say, well, we've got nothing to learn from this? Anybody? Uh, Mr. Joshua. I've, I've always been very critical of the Court of Appeal and its humility in relation to miscarriages of justice. I'm not sure this is perhaps the best example for criticising them on. But again, I think these are... Um, Professor Andrew Ashworth talked about catalytic cases where these you get the rare case that cuts through into public mm. consciousness and you can use those cases to make a change. And we've done that for things like abolishing the death penalty or introducing the Police and Criminal Evidence Act. My concern slightly is by making these cases just go away is we miss an opportunity to look at some of the problems that exist within the criminal justice system and particularly the appeal system and the criminal cases review commission it, it's a really good opportunity to to make the public understand this and um, so much can be learnt from it and we miss that if we just make these cases disappear that may, may be an, uh, another evidence session coming to up rosenberg something. yeah I, I put this point to the lady chief justice and and she made a couple of points in response uh, I suggested to her that surely the, the, the judges in the Crown Court would have been aware that something was going wrong, so many prosecutions, so many convictions. Uh, and she said in response to that point that the judges in different Crown Courts don't really get together and discuss what sort of cases they're dealing with. She said in many cases uh, defendants pleaded guilty. Now we all know that why some of them chose to plead guilty, but the courts simply went ahead on the basis that the defendant had pleaded guilty and, and therefore uh, moved to mitigation and sentencing. Uh, and uh, uh, for those which were contested, well, the judges take the view that these cases were decided by juries. We're talking mainly about the Crown Court. So uh, the judges don't feel that they did anything particularly wrong, but they do say that they're very willing to do everything they can to put it right. But if, but if the Lady Chief Justice's attitude is, well, you know, we don't think there's anything for us to learn, how, how, what's the mechanism through which that's going to, to happen? Uh, you know, I recognise juries make decisions, but the judge is supposed to be there as a safeguard for you know, due process and making sure the whole thing is fair. I, I, I'm sure she would answer your question by saying that uh, the judges have learned from this. Uh, but I think uh, she didn't feel that the judges should be blamed for these miscarriages of justice, given uh, what happened in the courts. 
I just say on the point of the um, mechanical device, there was a long period where defence barristers were saying to the police officer in drink driving cases, prove your machine was working, which is why the statute changed, which has then created yeah. the, the presumption that Horizon was working effectively. Can you remember doing exactly that? Yeah. <laughs> pro pro probably, probably dates me. <laughs> but, <laughs> but there, there, there you go, Ms Cherry. So really, it's rules of evidence yeah. rather than the judges who are to blame. But just getting back to this um, separation of powers thing, uh, I'm starting to be very persuaded by your argument, Dr Craig, because I think it's true to say, isn't it, that in the United Kingdom there is no strict separation of powers doctrine like there is in some other jurisdictions. But also, isn't the crucial distinction between the way the courts approach things and Parliament approaches things, the courts look at things, they, the court can only look at the case that comes before it, the individual case Whereas Parliament is in a position to step back and look at a, to use your words, Dr Craig, a systemic miscarriage of justice, which seems not to come from so much from what happened in the courts, but more what happened at the, at the back end or the front end of the procedure, something very, very dubious going on in the post office. We don't have time to get into that this afternoon. But certainly many of us feel that these prosecutions were malicious, and so the problem lies with the prosecutor possibly a wee bit different in Scotland because we've got the crown in between, but surely that must be the argument, the answer to the separation of powers argument, that there are certain uh, exceptional, uh, and there won't only be one, doesn't matter if we set a precedent because there could be other systemic problems in the future, but where it's a systemic problem affecting hundreds of innocent people and destroying lives in the way that we saw and shocking stuff, like a, you know, a pregnant woman being sent to prison that we saw, we've seen on the television um, for something she hadn't done. That's the, diff that's, that's the justification for Parliament coming in. But I, I know, Dr. because you disagree with me, Dr. Quirk, and I really thought your stuff you've written about this is fantastic, and I'd love you to sort of just encapsulate why what I'm saying is wrong. Because I, I think once you start changing the mechanism for certain cases, then it's much more open to abuse. So I could see an argument for all the convictions relating to <coughs> party gate or breaches of COVID regulations. That was unfair, you know, and Parliament could legislate to, to quash those. The minor strike convictions, um, the Northern Ireland cases, as I've mentioned. I think once you politicise individual convictions, it's a very dangerous road to go down. I think we have a mechanism that works. We, sh we should give it the resources to make sure it does so in these cases, because I think it's a terrible cliche, but hard cases and bad law. Well, I think absolutely the, the different points of view has been, been, been very helpful enough. Mr Seaman's final. Yeah, thank you. So the, the, the uh, uh, final question, we'll start with you, Dr Craig. Yeah. I'm thinking about the Glasgow South West constituent who was not convicted, but had to beg and borrow uh, to pay back a, a so-called shortfall from Horizon, which I would call a bogus debt. Mm -hmm. So there's clearly other issues. So are there other issues that you believe Parliament should consider addressing through legislation as a result of the Horizon scandal? Let's go around the panel. Let's go around the panel. The last word we'll go to Glasgow is always <laughs> Dr Neil. So we're starting with uh, Dr Craig. <clears throat> there are this, this catastrophe raises a large number of ancillary cases um, and issues. Um, and Parliament is seized of... of the potential future compensation claims that may be, may be coming through. But I'm not across enough detail on the cases where there was no conviction to, to be making concrete claims about this. One thing I will say, though, just which is a little bit unrelated, but it relates to what's really been proven here is just how much reputation matters in your local community, in the real world, out, out there in, in, in the country. And for me, and this is maybe a low-hanging fruit for, in some ways because it's got overwhelming public support in the opinion polls, this suggests that maybe all defendants should be anonymous until convicted, which goes to the point about the reputation being affected. But that's a separate point from the one. Interesting. Very big issue. I'm conscious of time, so I'll just go through it very quickly. I think you're absolutely right about wrongful accusations, and we need to look at the pressures on suspects for that. So the speed the cases are actually dealt with is f fundamentally important. People have these accusations hanging, them, hanging over them for years at the moment waiting for trial. Um, access to legal aid, if people are on moderate incomes they may not be eligible for, for legal aid which may affect their decisions that they're taking. Pressures to plead guilty, um, we need to look around issues around plea bargaining and then the work of the Criminal Cases Review Commission and compensation 
for those who've been wrongly convicted. Uh, Joshua, to you, because I'm obviously thinking about this from a debt point of view, which, which may be civil, but is there anything else that Parliament should uh, legislate on in relation to the Horizon scandal? I'm not sure about legislation, but if you're talking about what your constituents must be saying, and I can say this with the benefit of parliamentary privilege, uh, what an awful lot of people want to see is people from the post office facing criminal charges. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, you know, even to the extent that people are talking about bringing private prosecutions, which is somewhat ironic. Uh, now, it's obviously right to wait till the end of Sir Wynne Williams' public inquiry uh, to see what the evidence is. But that's the one thing that the public are looking for, and of course it's the one thing that Parliament shouldn't get involved in. Yeah. Thank you. And uh, Professor Chalmers, last word to Glasgow. I would, I would simply say that the kind of case you mentioned is one that should be addressed through compensation and not, like Dr Craig, on top of enough of the detail of that to answer whether it is adequately addressed at present. But I don't think that requires legislation to answer that problem. Mm -hmm. Thank, you. Thank you very much. Look, it's been wide-ranging. Um, uh, I'm very grateful to all of you uh, for, for your input. It's an unusual session for us to do, but we thought it was important to have this on the record prior to the debate on the bill, uh, which may come back to the House for its committee stage really quite, uh, quite swiftly, for all we know. So I'm immensely grateful to you for your time and your evidence today. We'll conclude this session, uh, and we'll swap over to our next panel. Apologies yeah. for keeping them waiting. Thank you. Yeah. Can we just give us... We'll just